G'day, and welcome to the AHDC podcast series, Health Design on the Go. I'm your host, David Cummins, and today we're speaking to Dr. Rhonda Kerr. Over the last 35 years, Rhonda has participated as a health planner and health economist in over 40 hospitals and health service development projects. In addition, she has had senior roles with Australian federal and state governments and advised public and private health services throughout Australasia and Asia. In addition to her role as the director of Rhonda Kerr and Associates Health Planners, Rhonda is a research fellow at the University of Western Australia. In 2016, Rhonda was also appointed the Director of Economics, Health, Services and Planning for the Guidelines and Economics Network International. Her doctorate research, undertaken at Curtin University, evaluated hospital capital funding systems in 18 OECD countries for efficiency, fiscal sustainability, delivery of clinical standards and responsiveness to clinical improvements and patient demand, which I'm excited to hear more about today. Welcome, Rhonda. Thank you for your time to be here. But I could have just spent 15 minutes reciting your CV. It's a very impressive CV. What has motivated you throughout your career to do so much and in such a little period of time? Health is such a fascinating area. I think that's why we're all attracted to it. It's a place of complex problems and people who are committed to making a difference. And I think that's where we all stand, wanting to improve how health can be delivered for our fellow Australians and for people across the world and also working with like-minded people around the world to be able to do the best we can in this very complex environment. I myself have read all your journal articles. I personally use them for my research and in the start of my PhD. Your research is quite unique in the sense that it really does relate to the patient. Constantly you're referring to the patient care, how health economics relates to patient, which A lot of people in the world of health economics don't always necessarily put two and two together. They generally talk about budgets and and planning and construction, but your research really does have a heart to it. That's very kind of you. You get an extra koala stamp for having read it all, David. (laughs) Thank you. But the point, surely, of healthcare, if we step away from it and stop thinking about the small problems, if we think about what it's all about, it's delivering patient access to appropriate care in effective settings. And so if you take that broader view, the patient is at the core of everything the clinicians do, but it also should be at the heart of how we value the inputs into the health system. And the values that we have as individuals and as professionals, we need to reflect in the value of investment, in my view. I completely agree. With my construction, I'll always say we put the patient first, not necessarily the budget, the scope, the stakeholders, all which is important. But for me, that core is really what differentiates health construction and health planning and health delivery versus any other industry. Mm. I think sometimes people put the tools for delivering health care ahead of the task of delivering health care. And that's what I'm seeking to do. Just remind us that unless it's focused on improving patient care, There's no point. Yeah, I 100% agree. And even to that point where universally everyone knows someone that's been in a hospital at some point in time. So your research really does have that universal appeal, no matter if it's a third world economic country, if it's Australia, if it's America, because at the heart of it is that patient. And ultimately what we do is to try and improve patient care for that community. Exactly. And it was through that international dimension, I thought a little bit further about what we're trying to achieve. And each country's in a different place with the delivery of clinical care. Britain's different to the USA, which is different again to, say, the Congo or to Yemen. They all have different challenges, but each of them has a set of clinicians, particularly medical specialists, who identify what it is they're able to achieve, what their standard of clinical care is. And if we use that as the standard in Australia or in any of those other countries, then we're able to replicate that into buildings. And that's how I think we can be effective. So the capital investment should reflect what's needed for the buildings to deliver that care, what medical equipment's needed to deliver that care, and what information and communication systems we can use to make the care more effective. And those three elements come together to be the capital allocation. If we can link that to the clinical care that we seek to provide at the patient level, it makes a huge difference. My research looked at 
the different types of capital that are needed for individual types of care. So you don't have one generic thing happening in a hospital. You have maternity services, medical care, outpatient services, surgical care. Each of them has specific needs. But in each country, they will respond to different clinical standards. Does that make yeah. sense, David? Yeah, it does. And I think as well, that's a really good point because it is dependent on what government is there. It does depend on the environment. It does depend on overseas factors as well. So even though there is many pools each way in the healthcare sector, at the end of the day, your research is actually applicable to whatever situation you're in. It's so variable and it can be applied at different points in time for the healthcare providers. Exactly. That's it. We need to make it a universal standard because I think clinicians do. They deliver the best care they can in any situation. It's limited by funding. It's limited by the range of resources they have. But if we're able there to ensure that they get the best opportunity to deliver care by providing enough money for appropriate facilities, for appropriate medical equipment and for the systems they need, I think it gives them a fighting chance of doing their best. And then these days of attrition in terms of burnout with our clinical staff, particularly nursing staff, but also medical staff, I think we have to think more strategically about how we effectively support clinical staff so they don't burn out. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges in this hopefully post-COVID world. How do we maintain effective clinical care through supporting clinicians with systems, but also effective facilities, not just for patient care, but also for their own clinical support, for pastoral care, for time out, for break spaces, for collegiate involvement. How do we make healthcare more effective through capital? Yeah, I think one of your latest research journal articles is about COVID and how the healthcare world has changed or will change. So can you just explain to those people that have not read your research what you expect to be some of those big changes for hospital projects? Yeah, I think there's going to be a huge number. In the last 30 years, we've perhaps not paid enough attention to infection control. It hasn't been a major issue. And so it's been common for wards to be built with many beds and one bathroom for many patients. COVID and the other respiratory diseases that are currently prevalent are proving that that's an ineffective way of supporting clinical care. Because if you put one patient with an infectious disease in that environment, everybody has that infectious disease and so do their carers. The research that was done by Roger Ulrich in the 80s and 90s identified that individual patient rooms with individual bathrooms, although they provide a slightly higher capital cost, end up providing lower cost in attrition of your clinical staff and shorter lengths of stay for patients with fewer complications. So if our aim is to provide effective and safe patient care and support clinical staff in what they do, the move towards individual patient rooms has to be the way to go rather than having shared facilities. Another of the things that's obvious from COVID is that we need to think about ventilation more effectively. But the clinical support and clinical training are going to be big areas. One of the OECD countries, as far as I can tell, but particularly the English-speaking countries, have had problems with retaining staff. So providing safe environments for staff to be cared for, perhaps not having one large shared space for clinical officers, but considering going back to individual officers might be one of the things that comes out of it. We need more research in these areas to identify which are the areas that will pay benefits and which won't. Another one that's come to mind is emergency departments. Previously, we'd had patients separated by curtains and no facilities for toileting within the emergency department. I think those things will have to be looked at again. The evidence on solid barriers between individual patients from the ICU studies would suggest that that would provide better infection control. I think emergency departments, infection control and patient flow are going to be significant issues coming forward. There are a range of other things in relation to sustainability, for example, that COVID's highlighted. Because both environmental and financial sustainability have been big issues during COVID, we have to provide better mechanisms for waste management in particular, all the, the donning and doffing of garments 
has been very, very expensive to hospitals, but to the environment. So if you balance that against individual patient treatment areas, it might be worth considering having solid barriers rather than the constant donning and doffing, but also the waste control issues. Yeah, I agree. And certainly there was a lot of hospitals, especially over in America and Europe, that were completely caught out by infection control standards. I know you said Australia doesn't have the highest priority in the last 30 years, but pretty much every hospital does have an infection control nurse of some capacity. Mm -hmm. But definitely in America, they were completely caught out by COVID, but also their hospital system, which a lot of those hospitals didn't have infection control rooms, didn't have the appropriate standards. Mm. And obviously, we all know what happened over there. I'm not saying it's purely got to do with infection control. There was obviously a huge, massive in the health system as well. But certainly there are hospitals in the world that do not have isolation rooms and do have shared bathrooms more than Australia. I agree with you. And I think one of the things has been that we need to elevate the voice of the infection control nurses. We haven't had infectious diseases wards since the 1990s. During AIDS, there were some, but not much after that. And our colleagues in Asia have identified how significant that was for them during SARS. And when you look at Vietnam and Canada to an extent, they've been really effective in managing the COVID outbreak because they had the preparation during SARS to treat infectious disease seriously. I totally agree. I'd like to challenge you a little bit or at least pick your brain Obviously, in aged care, a lot of aged care facilities, especially in private aged care and especially in Melbourne where COVID was hit so hard, Mm. in the aged care sector, there was a huge mortality rate, even Mm. though a lot of people in aged care have a separate room, separate bathroom, separate ensuite versus some COVID wards, which did have shared rooms, did have shared staff, did have lack of bathrooms. So ideally, in aged care, it should have actually been less COVID prevalent but it obviously wasn't. So my gut feeling is because of education and staff handling and staff education and staff infection control standards. Would that Entirely. be correct? I'm not an expert in that area at all, David, but my impression from what I have read is that, yes, my understanding is aged care had moved from a mini hospital approach, if I can characterise it as that, to making aged care more homely, more comfortable. And also in that time, we de-skilled the nursing staff so that there were very few nurses compared to what had happened, say, 30 years ago. It was more likely to be low level of training in patient care assistance. So I think the staffing was the major issue from some of the coronial inquests that have come out. And I say that about everything to do with capital investment too. It's the staffing that delivers the care. It's the people that deliver the care. It's the clinicians. Our task is to support. So I would always put them at the beginning and the end of any relationship with patients. Yeah, I completely agree. And I I do take on board your point that more rehabilitation and aged care isn't your specialty, but certainly acute is one of your specialties. And Mm -hmm. a lot of your papers have been written about the acute setting. I know you briefly touched on emergency, but in a private and public healthcare setting, how -hmm. important is understanding uh, a capital uh, allocation of costs and how important is a funding model in a private healthcare setting for patient care? Oh, that's such a good question, David. If we think about it, again, stepping away more broadly, we need to identify, go back to Economics 101, if I can do that. And it said that to produce a service, we need to have two elements, capital and labour. Now, the labour component is generally 75 to 80% of the costs of any hospital. And I think private hospitals would be much the same based on the Productivity Commission report that was done into private and public hospitals some years ago. But the capital elements vary according to what the specialty areas of the hospital are. And the private hospitals are really, really good at identifying specific needs and responding to specific needs. They do magnificent work in surgical care, increasingly in cancer treatment now, but to a lesser extent in medical care. They're really good in maternity care. But those are areas that they invest in very specifically. They know how many patients 
they're going to have through. They know the number of labour delivery wards they're going to have. They know the number of operating theatres, what sort of imaging they need to get on board. They're very good at specific investment targeted at specific outcomes in terms of keeping their clinicians happy, their surgeons particularly, but also in being able to identify their patient volumes. Public hospitals don't have quite that luxury. There's a general idea of how many people might come to the door, but our experience of this last 20 years, and particularly the last two years, has been that our estimates have been continuously wrong. We've underestimated the level of demand coming to the door of public hospitals, either as emergency departments, so the ambulance ramping that we've seen in every state in Australia, but also the extraordinary surgical waiting lists that are just going backwards at a great rate of knots. Each health department's putting in as much money as it can, but not as much money as is needed to be able to support either the staff or provide enough operators and surgical bays for those patients. So I think it's time to reevaluate how we support clinical care. And I think we have to do it at the patient level, following that model of the private sector, that if you're going to have a huge volume of maternity cases coming through, you invest in maternity, you invest in labour and delivery wards, in operating theatres and in beds. If you're going to have an increase in surgical patients of particular types, you take advantage of your knowledge in that area. And we have really good knowledge these days coming from our activity-based funding system. So within the last three months, we can talk about how many people were cared for under each diagnosis group. It would be wonderful if we could provide a level of investment that matched that level of demand. But my research, as you've read, David, shows that fewer than 14% of Australian hospitals get any capital funding over a four-year period. So we're going backwards and that comes back down to the governments and who's in power and what's in power. You could almost predict through history, if it's a Labor government, what's going to happen into health, and if it's a Liberal government, what's going to happen to health. You can pretty much, I don't know if there is any research, to map you know, the funding versus the government, but you can pretty much predict what each government would do. I'm sure there is research. I, just, I think everyone knows it, though. <laughs> but it's funny. I thought that too. I agree with you. I, I remember driving down the road at Hurston near Royal Brisbane, and there was identified a building for every election since about 1900. So yet what you say is intrinsically and seems correct, but I tried to map that against investment levels and I couldn't find that result. So I thought I would find what you're suggesting, that there'd be more expenditure under Labor, less under Liberals or Country Party, and I wasn't able to find that result. I found that, for example, New South Wales has had a policy of $2 billion of investment every year for quite a long time, and that's a standard policy, Labor or Liberal. I've been very impressed that here in Western Australia, each government, Labor or Liberal, has invested about 11% of the national level of investment into hospitals here. Um, so when I did the research, I wasn't able to publish it because no one believed that it wasn't as you said. But it is that case. The thing that I have noticed, though, is the trend to how you deliver hospitals if it's likely to be a conservative government, they're more likely to think the private sector has the answers. If it's not a Liberal government, if it's a Labor government, they're more likely to move away from that private delivery. And as you'll know from my research in OECD nations, of the 18 OECD nations I looked at, private-public partnerships proved to be the second least effective form of funding patient access to appropriate care in efficient hospitals. The most effective way of delivering patient access to appropriate care in effective hospitals was by diagnosis group, funding each patient's capital needs by diagnosis group. And that's a step we've not taken in Australia. We're still in a system that we developed after World War II, that the politicians would determine how much funding went for any hospital based on a system of priorities. And sadly, it's meant that some hospitals have never ever made it to the priority list, sometimes for political reasons, sometimes because they weren't considered to be needy enough and other environments were better at having their voices heard. It's hard to know why, but you could see definite patterns. 
So my research has led me to advocate away from allowing politicians to have those decisions as to how much capital is allocated for any hospital to a system where it's linked to the patient and to the clinical care that's needed to be provided for that patient. So to the patient, to the treatment and to the outcome. That's how I believe we should allocate capital. It sounds so simple. (laughs) I know, it's deceptively simple, dangerously simple, but Rather than based on political priorities, we saw that in the corruption inquiry to the former Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian had to deal with, where it was exposed that she changed the amount of money that went to a particular hospital based on the appeal of the local member, if I can put it that way. And I'm sure that's not a unique case. Yeah, definitely. Touching base on what you said before, and I think I'm definitely one of those people that's underestimated the needs of the public for the healthcare sector, and keeping in mind those figures of $2 in in New South Wales, uh, WA is very similar, Queensland and Melbourne, very, very similar, Adelaide has had billion-dollar hospitals. In my very small brain, making bigger billion-dollar hospitals isn't necessarily the answer. Having more beds and more services is probably the answer, in addition to more staffing. But in your mind, is these billion-dollar, phenomenally designed hospitals, is that the answer or is it more beds or is it more staffing? Like, we understand the problem, but what is the solution? Again, as I said earlier, complexity is the character of the health sector, and that's why it's so engaging. Staffing is absolutely the priority. No care can be delivered from an empty hospital. And training, providing environments for appropriate training, I think will be one of the big outcomes after this COVID experience. But the billion dollar hospital in and of itself, I think will need to continue because they provide super specialty services. We're going through the fourth great industrial revolution in terms of technology. And so technologies are naturally fostered in those bigger specialist environments subspecialties are created in those bigger environments and then they filter down to more local and community hospitals. So I agree with what you're saying. We need to have care closest to the patient but it needs to be in a clinically safe environment. So again I say patient outcome is the critical denominator for how we make the judgments rather than making a judgment about a 300-bed hospital is the appropriate size or a 700-bed hospital is the wrong size. They're not the things that matter. It's not the asset that's critically important. It's how effective the asset is as a tool for delivering good health outcomes. If you were in rural Victoria, you might have a different outcome to if you were in central Adelaide. Ensuring we have an equity of access to appropriate services is the key in my mind. Yeah, I 100% agree. I I know there's some hospitals in Australia that are struggling so much just to get staff to provide that care for various reasons. And at the end of the day, you're 100% right. If you have a brand new spanking, beautiful hospital with waterfalls and angels singing and everything bells and whistles, but at the end of the day, if you don't have the staff to care for it, It's sort of worthless. Entirely. But also, if we had funding that was relevant to the patient, that followed the patient, it would be possible to build up some of the services in remote areas, as long as you could get the staff to follow. So we've got activity-based funding in Australia funds doctors, nurses and allied health professionals for the delivery of specific care. The only thing we don't have is the capital. So they don't have the place to deliver that care. They don't have the equipment they need, the diagnostics behind them. I use as an example dialysis in the Kimberley and Central Australia. For far too long, the people of Central Australia and the Kimberley and the Pilbara didn't have access to dialysis, even though they had the highest rates of kidney disease in Australia. Those are the sort of issues that we need to challenge with how we fund services, both the operating costs and the capital costs to follow them and support clinical care. Yeah, very interesting. And just before we go, I don't know if we're allowed to get a scoop on the podcast, but I believe there's another article coming out in the near future. I do hope so, David. There's one I'm working on on how to invest effectively in patient care 
and another one that looks at why Australia has such poor access problems with hospital beds and why we've fallen to 2.2 public hospital beds per thousand population from the OECD average, which I think from memory was 4.5 beds per thousand population. And previously, Australia had a comfortable level of health service provision at between three and five beds per thousand population. So we've fallen behind in our investment we've fallen behind our population growth. And that doesn't include the fact that we had temporary workers in Australia for a long period of time, making up to a million other people. So we have to be realistic about our health care and who we're delivering care to and what we expect to achieve. COVID's proven that if we don't care for the least, everybody suffers. Does that research touch base on the resources as well to provide that care or just purely patient versus bed? At the moment, it's patient versus bed because I can't drill down into the resources for each region in terms of capital investment. It's not publicly available information. Mm. That would be very interesting to have that extra dimension, wouldn't it? I know, but Australia's since 2016 no longer reported on how we invest in hospitals or what level of investment there is, what level of capital we have. It wasn't considered important. What you don't measure, you don't regard. And I think it was Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist, says that if you don't value what you measure, you won't make sensible decisions. And I'm saying that part of our access problems to hospitals at the moment is based on the fact that we've failed to value the resources that are needed to support clinical care. Yeah, very interesting. I'll tell you what is important. It's all your research. So thank you so much for your dedication to this industry, to Australia, to the world, in the world of health design, health research, health economy, health economics, and especially patient care. Thank you very, very much. Absolute pleasure to be speaking to you and, and continuing to read your research. David, you're very, very kind, and I really appreciate the chance to have this chat. Thank you so much. That's okay. Thank you, Rhonda, for your time. You have been listening to the Australian Health Design Council podcast series, Health Design on the Go. If you'd like to learn more about the AHDC, please connect with us on our website or LinkedIn. Thank you for listening.